And, and a lot of companies will just think, oh, well, if, if I need to grow my sales, I'm just going to hire more salespeople. And that may not be the best solution for each business. And, and I think if they have someone that's focused operationally on how to help their salespeople succeed outside of the owner of the business, they're going to drastically see, um, you know, year over year improvements and, and a much better return on that hire than just simply purchasing a system or platform and then, and then hoping it does its thing, right? Everybody. Welcome out to the D2D podcast. And I'm your host, Sam Taggart, with Sean Huckstep today. And before I dive into this, is going to be a long time podcast coming. Sean and I go way back. And it goes all the way back to the point where I go into Sales Rabbit, and he's the VP of Sales of Sales Rabbit. And he has done door to door for three years, pest control, satellite. He was you know, ran teams. Now he's trained and worked with thousands of door door companies, the data, the analytics, the, the sales solutions and implementation and what he's seen, the nuances of probably a hundred different industries all over the world. And it, it, this is going to be a wealth of knowledge when it comes to sales, sales velocity. And it was interesting. I go into sales rabbit. What was this? 2017 in the summer. And I was like, I'm going to throw this event called door to door or something. I don't even know. And we start thinking through, we're like, what should we do? And how do we do it? And we partner and they became our platinum sponsor. And we signed a, an exclusive with them. We're like, Hey, we're going to go hard for five years. And we're going to, you know, promote you and you promote us and help us. And they even actually see this logo in the background, the, like the infinity logo. They help create that. They're like little design team. Little does anybody know, like their people came up with the coolest logo and I picked that one and I was like, yeah, that, that's, that's legit. <laughs> so fun fact about sales rabbit. Um, yeah. But anyway, I am, I'm stoked to have them as a platinum vendor at door to door con. They've always been a huge support. So grateful for them. I, they've come to a lot of other events and they have been nothing but supportive. So welcome to the show, Sean. So excited to have you guys. And uh, yeah, thank you, Sam. Yeah, it's it's so good to be on with you. And and really thinking back to those early days, it's been a little while since I've been able to reflect on that and think about what happened and what took place and all those little nuances of of really helping to to start and see you know what you've been able to build and do, and um, you know just the the honor the honor the integrity that you've been able to bring to the industry and really help up level everyone has been phenomenal. And then just to see you as an individual continue to grow and help bring additional insights and become such an influence in the space has been phenomenal to to just watch and observe from kind of the background. Thank you, man. I, I okay. I remember. Let's reflect on. I get asked to speak. This is before DDDCon. IMG, where was that? Orlando, or no, New Orleans. And we're, yeah. it says January 1st of 2018. Door to door, no, it was the week of Door to Orcon. So it was like January 10th. Door to Orcon might have been on the 15th. And I fly out to New Orleans. I, I see Sean. I was like, Sean, I've never been to a roofing event. What is this? And I just see all these crazy roofers out there. And I'm just like, tell me what's going on. I'm doing a workshop. And yeah, tell me about that experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, uh, I mean, we, we at Sales Rabbit actually, we originally started in the satellite space and then we didn't even really discover the roofing industry for a couple of years after we started Sales Rabbit. And so, you know, prior to you getting into the roofing industry, we only had a few years uh, on top of that. And, and we've learned a ton about that industry. Um, so far, but the uh, the roofing industry is such a unique industry, um, and there are some amazing, incredible people that's just full of energy, very passionate about what they do, uh, and they're really eager to learn how to be better at sales. And uh, I remember you you coming in um, and doing your first event, and and is before you probably had a, a bigger brand and and a name and. 
Uh, we still had a, a good amount of people in the room, probably not to the capacity that you fill rooms to this point, but um, just so many people are there and, and hungry and ready to learn and, and figure things out. Yeah, it was so interesting because I was like, dude, I don't like what are these guys going to like? And I, I was surprised even people showed up because nobody knew who I was. And it was like my workshop title was probably what brought the crowd. It was how to sell like a badass. And I was like, felt guilty <laughs> for using the word ass in my title. <laughs> I was like, it and resonates. I'm like, it oh, resonate. resonated so well with these people <laughs> and then blue minds. And then everybody's like, oh, my gosh, who are you? And I sold some books. Yeah. And it was just it was just so fun. Um, anyway, so. Let's dive in. So I, I, I really want to dive into this concept. You were just talking about it before the podcast on sales velocity. And, and, and I have so much that I want to talk on. So if you're a sales rep, um, this is going to be super applicable. And if you're a sales company, this is going to be yeah. super applicable. So I'm going to kind of cater it to both. And we're going to start from the sales yeah. rep's perspective. And, you know, first, let's explain the concept of sales velocity. It's a formula that sales companies, whether you're SaaS, whether you're you know, door to door, yeah. whatever needs to kind of understand. So break that down in simple layman terms. Yeah. So sales velocity, it's, it's really a single metric that is, is kind of a, a conglomerate of several different key performance indicators that a sales company would look at. And it really is there to give you a trend as to uh, how well your business or you as a salesperson is selling from an efficiency standpoint, it, it essentially just reflects, um, you know, how quickly you are moving leads through your funnel to produce revenue for your business. So in the, in the simplest form, that's what sales velocity is. Love it. So speed to get lead to sell, basically. And yeah. there's a few factors that go into that. And what would you say some of the key factors would be that you see in sales companies that help them drive those levers to say, I'm going to get more leads and get them converted faster and make yeah. that a smooth process? Yeah, so there is, is so much. I mean, in, if we break down the sales velocity formula as a whole, there's really four components that make up that formula. Um, one is uh, the number of opportunities. Two, it's your average deal size. So what's the value of one deal worth to you? Uh, your win rate. So out of how many people you have an opportunity to sell, how many of those do you close? And then what's your length of sales cycle? Is it two days? Is it one week? Is it 30 days? Is it 60 days? Um, and so those are the four main levers that you're looking at to create this sales velocity score. Now, what's meaningful in, in when you ask, well, what are all the things that go into increasing that score? Well, if we look at those four categories, again, number of opportunities, average deal size, win rate, and length of sales cycle, you could spend an entire podcast on each one of those uh, core subjects and those levers to really break down what um, needs to go into each one of those. And um, overall, this metric isn't, isn't something that you look at necessarily on a daily basis. This is something that as a sales rep or as an organization, you should be looking at from a trend perspective, meaning uh, from one month to the next or quarter to quarter or year to year, is that sales velocity increasing or is it decreasing? If it's not increasing year after year, quarter after quarter, then something is amiss within your sales flow, your funnel, your pipeline. And we need to understand what is driving that decrease in your sales velocity. Um, the point of a sales team is continue to produce more revenue for business. And if it, it, it's so surprising to me, Sam, and I'm, I'm telling you like 80% of all of companies that sell B2C, like door to door, that come in and talk to sales rabbit, majority of them wouldn't even be able to tell you what their sales numbers are. So those four metrics that we look at, or let alone how many leads they produce or how many people do their reps talk to in a given day, like no one really knows their metrics. And so the first thing is, is companies that we work with, it is the most crucial, important thing for them to identify these metrics 
from the start, if they're not tracking them or they haven't been tracking them historically, they need to start today and start tracking them to set their baseline or their benchmark to really understand how they're going to grow and what's going to influence that growth in their sales velocity. Because if you can't track these numbers, there's no way that you're going to ever be able to improve that as a sales org. So out of all the podcasts that I've done, I've done 250. I've interviewed people like Jim Quick and Ed Milet and all the Tom, John, John Maxwell. Like out of all the people I've interviewed, if you're listening to this, I'm telling you, this is going to be some of the most impactful stuff to change your business. And the reason I say that is because I've consulted now over 250 companies where I've gone to their offices. I've had over 800 businesses come to my boot camps. I've had tens of thousands of salespeople in my audiences and training and DMs. And you have two. There's only two people and two organizations that could say numbers even close to that in this industry. And so yeah. it's so funny because we see over and over again, what you just said is businesses and salespeople come to us and they're like, help us get better, help us sell more, help me recruit more, help me fix my business. I have a guy that called me this morning out of Chicago and I have a coaching call with them at two. And he's like, I can't seem to get my ops people and my sales people to jive. And you know, they're just fighting because the sales guys are getting lazy and demotivated. What do I need to fix this? And I simply say, send me the data. But if you don't have the data, how am I supposed to diagnose what your problem is and you're yeah. like he's like fix me sam fix me <laughs> and i'm like okay i'm gonna give you my best you know honest try and i'm sure yeah. come to you and they're like i got this app that tracks area management and you're like you're missing it you're missing it yeah this isn't yeah. area management this is a technology to get data to then have lever conversations that drive my business forward and so mm -hmm. as you, you know, reps, here's the bigger problem. People get apps that are, you know, for those that don't know what sales rabbit is, it's a knocking app or sales enablement tool or sales velocity tool is the better way to put it is to say, I need to see how many doors or, or contacts or attempts made, whether, you know, you're knocking or contacts made, I need to then see how many are actually converting into demos then how many are actually converting into closed deals? And what's the average deal size, like what he said? And then yeah. what's, how long are those things sitting in my pipeline? So it's kind of yeah. like, okay, why are we in this neighborhood for such a short amount of time when there's so much more opportunities here? How often am I re-knocking? How often am I recalling and following up and all that kind of stuff? All of that needs to live from data that the sales rep puts into something. And if yep. we don't give it the inputs, then there's no outputs, like there, there's no communication. And so I had a, you know, we've had problems with our dialer, log me in. I do a lot of inside sales, we have a sales team. And yesterday they sent out the dashboard. I was like, what the freak? You made six calls all day today? Like I started calling people out. I'm like, what the freak, dude? We're door to door experts, not like phone experts, but damn it, my sales guys better be knocking. And, um, you know, and then all of a sudden I find out that the thing's broken, but I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to calm down. Like, he's like, no, no, but I did it for myself. <laughs> but it's like the fact that I know and could see and could track how many calls they made, how many, you know, and, and they know that I'm writing like you're, you can't fake work ethic when you're inputting data, but if nobody's yeah. tracking all of this, then how, how do I know how to manage my team? So like, I guess. Yeah. What are some best practices? I guess one is if I'm a sales leader or manager to get my people to actually start inputting the data. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, the first initial best practice is you need to have a system of truth and you need to have a system of record. If you don't have that, that is the first and foremost crucial step that you need to take as an organization. And it's surprising in the techni uh, technology world that we live in right now, so many businesses still haven't implemented some type of digital solution to track things. And it's shocking. And I, I feel like companies are just losing money daily uh, because they don't have these things in place. And some companies don't want to spend the money and the resources from a budgetary perspective 
to invest into processes and systems that's going to benefit their reps and their company because they look at it as an expense. Um, but in reality, it's a cost more than it is an expense because you are costing your business money, you're costing your, your sales reps time, and, and you're just wasting a lot of efficiencies. And so that's, that's the first step really. Yeah, 100%. Uh, what companies so if I'm a do. sales rep. Oh, so. Yeah. One, one other thing I was just going to say, Sam, and, and this is a common thing that we see is that companies will then step two, they get they get their uh, process, they get some type of, of tool in place, and then they're like, all right, we got it. It's it's done. We have it. That's all we need to do. And it's like, no, no, that's like completely wrong. And, and we see so many businesses and owners that try and take ownership of all of their operational tools. And they think just by purchasing a system, it's all of a sudden going to give them everything that they need. And, and it's couldn't be further from the truth. Really, people should be investing in some type of sales operation or sales enablement hire as soon as possible. And I think if a company has more than five salespeople in their org and they don't have someone to help with sales operations and enablement, they're missing the mark and, and they're slowing their sales and their growth as business down because they don't have someone that's focused on helping to improve uh, those conversion metrics. And, and a lot of companies will just think, oh, well, if, if I need to grow my sales, I'm just going to hire more salespeople. And that may not be the best solution for each business. And, and I think if they have someone that's focused operationally on how to help their salespeople succeed outside of the owner of the business, they're going to drastically see, um, you know, year over year improvements and, and a much better return on that hire than just simply purchasing a system or platform and then, and then hoping it does its thing. Right. hundred percent. So mm-hmm. I'm going to put myself in the sales rep shoes now. Um, yep. uh, it just takes time. I don't know. I just, you know, I remember I can go into a neighborhood and I can, you know, I, I pretty much know who I talk to. I mean, these are the constant things. It's like, no, you know, like, why would I, why would I do this? I don't look at it. Like, and, and so often we've been taught, you know, know your ratios. So how does ratios in sales help me as a sales rep improve, not improve? Like, like what, what's the importance of me understanding as an individual Like why? Right. So I'm talking managers. It's like, do this so you can micromanage. But so many people are like, stop micromanaging me. I'm my own boss. I'm 1099, whatever. But I'm sitting here going, let's flip the script. You're your own boss. Yeah. Why are these metrics and ratios and data points so important to you as you? Yeah. Well, first of all, it, it just comes back to revenue and production. Right. And and if I'm a sales rep out in the field, it's like, okay, I want to make more money for myself. Uh, well, my first reaction is either A, I need to go knock more doors or I need to talk to more people. Uh, or B, I need to improve my skill set and close deals at higher rate, both of which are great levers to pull on. It's just not the the only lever that you can pull on as a sales rep, right? There's so many different steps with between lead creation and closing a deal that you can incrementally improve in order to create a better outcome for yourself, which ultimately means more money. But if you're not tracking each step of the progression of a sales lead within your funnel, you're never going to know where you can have those incremental improvements to ultimately drive the end result of success, which is revenue produced or sales uh, or income you know, whatever way you want to look at it. And so, uh, you know, I think the difference between like a good rep and a great rep is, is someone that understands that process every step of the way. Um, and they're, they're looking at each of those steps and identifying it because they know what that does to, to the outcome on the other end. hundred percent. I'm going to apply this onto fitness, right? I weigh 200 pounds. I want to lose 20 pounds. It's a very simple formula. Calories burnt 
and calories intake, right? Like inputs yep. and outputs. And, you know, I met with a fitness coach and he's had me started using my fitness pal. Well, he reams me when I miss a few days and he goes, Hey, Sam, it looks like you ate zero calories yesterday. Congrats, dude. How are you feeling today? And I'm like, no, no, no. I just forgot to log it. And he's like, well, if you want to go get fit and you want to go and actually lose and, 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 and have your health goals, you need to have X amount of protein, X amount. He has me counting my macros, I, you know, yeah. 200 carbohydrates, 150 grams of protein and 50 grams of fat. Well, in order for him to give me inputs and feedback, I weigh myself weekly, progress photos weekly. You know what I mean? And, it, and it's showing this graph as I input it into his app. It, it's progressively seeing how I can expand. And in life, oftentimes our managers, our business owners aren't willing to have the hard conversations with us to say your inputs, meaning you knocking seven doors today and talking to one person is never going to help you hit your goal. And yeah. you are you oftentimes the individuals aren't as themselves willing to have the conversation with themselves, because I'll be honest, last night. I didn't want to log the simple fact that I ate some ice cream and a brownie at the jazz game. And, but then I was like, but that would only be cheating myself. It's not like I'm trying to hide it from somebody. It's not like he's micromanaging him. I paid him to do this for me. And so now he gets to say, Whoa, look at that 571 calories that you inputted on ice cream. And you know what I mean? And I think oftentimes we get resentful when it comes to, using the apps because we don't want people to know yeah. where we are and what we're doing. And then you go, well, who's that really hurting? Yeah. Oh, totally. It's, it's a, a complete paradigm shift for a lot of people. Yeah. So what, so let me, let's ask some crazy like examples of people that started actually, I'm sure you've tracked growth, sales performance, um, what are some use cases of companies you've seen come into you maybe a few years ago, where they're at today, and how they've utilized the sales tools to help scale? Yeah. So there's there's a long list of, of companies that we could dive into and talk about. The the first company that comes to my mind is uh is actually a security company. And um Essentially, they have a process that's very similar to a lot of, of companies that sell door-to-door, -door, right? They have refs that go out there, they generate leads, and um, a few of their team just does canvassing where they go out and collect leads and then schedule them for a closer. And then you also have another team that does both simultaneously. Um, and so what they did is, is they migrated on the sales rabbit. And, and again, it's not as much about the platform that you use as far as making sure you're getting these metrics in place. But um, what they, they noticed and they identified is that they would have um, certain reps that would go out earlier in the day and they would try and go and knock doors and generate leads and then they would finish through the night. And, and then when they looked at, at the data, as far as the best time of day to knock, when they're getting the most deals, when they're getting the most appointments, um, it was actually between the hours of five and seven o'clock. And so they look at it and now what they've noticed is that their highest performing reps, they would go and try and set appointments and, and uh, collect more leads and try and generate more leads and then try and have their appointments or meeting with people earlier in the day to avoid that time that's best to actually prospect and generate leads. And so when you start to understand that data and can look at it and, and then plan your day around what's gonna be the most effective or efficient use of your time, you start to see these incremental improvements um, because now, you know, hey, my time to actually prospect, because statistically speaking, these are my best odds to get a hold of people between five and seven. 
now what I'm going to do is I'm going to only have appointments where I'm going to try and close people either before or after that. And I'm going to designate my time to prospecting during those hours so that I can generate more leads and keep my pipeline full. And, and on the outcome, um, they're able to transition their whole entire organization over to making sure they're running this particular schedule to maximize efficiency of a given day to ultimately increase sales, right? Whereas before it's just like, oh, we'll just go out and knock whenever you want or whenever you feel like it. And and let's just give a, a hoorah cheer before we go out and pump each other up and, and make the most of it, right? And some people do well and some people don't. But the other thing is if we can motivate people and say, hey, we're going to have these two hours where we're completely on board as a company where we're looking at the metrics during the two hours. We're motivating people during the two hours. We're creating incentives around those two hours of who's generating the most leads. And what you're doing is you're shifting the behavior within an organization and everyone's on board with what's happening during those two hours. And then it, it just does wonders for the company in generating higher quality leads that are going to ultimately close and produce revenue for business. Love that. So let's let's talk about the dashboarding element of that. So in these tools, most of the time they have, you know, and especially sales rabbit, they have kind of a, an ability to display leaderboards. And yeah. how do you, how how do people use leaderboards, and why is that so important when it comes to a sales culture? So uh, leaderboards are, are used within every top tier sales organization. Like I haven't met a company that has a great sales culture and a high performing sales team without leaderboards. I just, it just doesn't exist. I feel like they go hand in hand with each other. And the reason being is because there is a, a natural I don't know, call it uh, behavior, desire, motivation to be the best salesperson in an organization that you can be. Yeah. And in some, uh, some companies respond to that and they say, oh, we don't want to like let our team see each other's stats or we don't want to let, um, we don't want to create that much competition. We want to create a good sales culture where people aren't like pressured or feel like they have to do a certain amount it's like what are you kidding me like why would you not want to create that competition in that that drive because it pushes those sales reps every single day to be the top person on that leaderboard because there's bragging rights there's a sense of pride there and and reps will go and do so many things for a company organization just to be at the top and so leaderboards are, are used to just simply highlight top performers, but they're also used in uh, creating competitions incentives. Like it's pretty common. In, and I'm sure you can speak really well to this, Sam, as you run a lot of different company competitions where uh, you put people head to head against one another. You put, you know, uh, team A versus team B head to head together. And it's almost like, Everyone in team A is trying to help everyone outperform the other team just for bragging rights. And you don't even have to put like a dinner or some type of prize on the line. It's just for the fact that they can brag about that and, and hang that over other people's heads. And, and uh, I just don't think you have a good sales culture at all if you don't have leaderboards and you don't have people pushing themselves to rank on those leaderboards. Yeah, I mean, and if people are like, fighting the element of public leaderboard i would challenge them and i would say is there an insecurity happening here yeah is it is it because you're not on top you know what i mean and it's like you know kind of play on their ego a little bit be like oh wow. must be somebody that doesn't like accomplishing a lot in the world like, oh, you know, one of those <laughs> yeah. underperformers in life like you know what i mean it's like use that as their motivation it's like no no and you're like oh, oh okay then why wouldn't you be a, a why would you be opposed to it? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, I better see my name at the top. And if I see my name at the bottom, it's a clear indication. People are going to weed themselves out when they start getting exposed. One of the big yeah. drivers of, of, of action is exposure. If you think about exposure, yeah. it's like you, nobody likes that feeling of I'm, 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 I'm out there in the open and it's public 
And I'm either humiliated, yeah. but everyone likes the dopamine hit of, look at me, I am the best, right? Oh, yeah. So, and, and those are the people that, that you really want on your team, right? Yeah. Those low performers that are, are so skeptical of having it or don't perform or it almost demotivates them because their names are at the bottom. Like hanging on to those people and in your org can be cancerous and can destroy the culture and bring everyone down. And it's like you want to continue to find more and more people that are like your top performers and your top performers are always going to care about leaderboards. It's just, just how it goes. 100%. Now, the next question would be area strategy. What are some best practices to, you know, and obviously I've noticed it's obviously different industry to industry. I mean, I'm in pest control. I'm moving through area a little quicker. If I'm in solar, I'm going through a lot slower. I, I guess speak to best practices on milking and managing consistency in area. Yeah, so... Um, we see a lot of companies manage this so differently um, from organization to organization. It's pretty interesting. Um, where we'll have uh, some companies that will assign their reps like 10 areas at a time. And it's like, hey, you get these 10 areas for the next two weeks and utilize them as much as you can. And then in two weeks, we're going to assign you another 10 areas, right? We also see companies where it's like, uh, here is your area. Here is, you know, a hundred homes and you need to be in here the next three days. And it, it, there's definitely a balance to it, right. Um, where you don't want to just necessarily restrict an individual and not give them enough homes to hit, but you don't want to give them so much that they're not working that area and, and squeezing as much juice out of it as possible. Yes. What, what we've, found um, and what we've noticed just in trends and looking at successful companies that manage area well and from a data perspective is um, that uh, reps will get two areas at a time and those areas will have anywhere from I would say one to 300 homes just depending on how densely populated those areas are right mm -hmm. uh, so you got to understand your area and how rural or how dense it is yeah when you have uh, to, when you have to pull out a scooter to go to home to home <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, your area changes a little bit but if we think of just a traditional neighborhood where you know um you have one neighborhood let's call it and there's 100 to 200 homes in a neighborhood right um we we want to see people um hit those areas uh, over multiple days at different times of day, meaning you should knock through mm. uh, the same hundred homes almost like three times in a given day. So you should be at the morning, you should hit him in the afternoon, and then yes. in the evening, right? And then, and then the reason why and you want to have Saturdays is like an extra bonus, like run through. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and so if you have a couple territories assigned, really a couple territories should last you a week. And it's almost like you're rotating those territories. So meaning territory one, I'm going through um, morning, afternoon, evening. And then day two, it's almost like you're reversing it and you're hitting the homes at night that you missed the first day. You're hitting those in the morning. And then the ones that they hit in the morning, you're coming to in the afternoon, right? And then the reason why you're having two territories is so you can go almost every other day in those those territories so that when you come to Saturday like you mentioned you're now getting back to all of those homes that didn't answer that you didn't talk to on a Saturday when you have just increased your odds of getting in touch with people okay. ideally we're we're seeing like at minimum at minimum like a 70% level of saturation for a territory before you move on meaning that I've talked to seven out of 10 people in that area. Now, whether I've gotten a yes or a no, that's different, but you just want to have and at least make contact with seven out of 10 people before you just move on to another territory. And, and it's common uh, in, in the trend we see is that 
the better the rep is, the less territory they need because they're more effective in those territories. And once you start selling a few people in a single territory, you, it, that success just replicates. And so you want to be careful of just burning through territory and, and going through it. And, and it's interesting because you have those, you know, let's call it first year reps that go out and knock doors. They burn through territory and literally two days later, a veteran sales rep can just go in, knock behind them, and they sell 15 deals yeah. when, when the first year is like, this is the worst territory I've ever been in. Like, Always. get me out of here. And it's like, no, that's that's not how it works. That happens all the time. People yeah. deem this area is, this is blacklisted. Never anybody could ever sell here again. I talked yeah. to 10 people and they were all dicks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, it's so common. And I, I, I look at area inefficiency in time management as the two biggest killers of success in door to door. It's yeah. not necessarily skill. It's not necessarily, you know, maybe hours, just time spent working, but call that time management. Like you're actually talking to prospects, you know, time of day, like you said, am I going to the homes that are home versus all of the homes Am I hitting it morning, evening, night, rotating, Saturday run-throughs? Am I multiple times talk points? Am I 70, 80, 90% saturation in my areas? Because I'm, or am I skipping out on losing momentum by starting new areas? I just did an interview with Jory Sullivan and he was like, my biggest fear is having to start a new area, which is an interesting yeah. concept where it's like, you just built momentum and momentum. You become the, the mayor of your town is yeah. what we call it. And at that point, it's hard to go be a new mayor and start from scratch and earn the light, the hearts and minds of everybody in a new territory. So my goal is to stay as long as you can um, and become the Absolutely. mayor of town. Well, we got to kind of wrap up. So, Sean, what what are some other just big tips or things that are on the tip of your tongue that you'd want to share with the industry? You know, you've got a platform here to kind of share. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So for me, you know, we talked a lot about um, just what a rep can do to increase and make the most of, of what they're doing in a given day. Um, and I just think it's so important that companies and organizations really understand what a rep goes through in a given day and yes. does everything they can to increase the rep experience and make that as good and as high quality of an experience and flow for the rep as possible because what happens and what we generally see and naturally we're always about creating good customer experience right where we want to look at a customer experience we want to take care of our customers we want to do everything we can for our customers we want to make sure that they have a good experience so they refer more people to us so that we can sell more deals right and we're constantly looking at reviews and understanding well how does our website look and how do we come across when we do this and how much how satisfied are the customers post install or fulfillment right but the thing that gets neglected and and really misunderstood is that your rep experience will always precede a customer's experience and if we're not taking care of the reps and creating a good experience for them, how are they supposed to create a good experience for your customer? And so it's so crucial that you invest time, you invest resources, and you don't just throw reps out into the field and say, have at it go sell as many as you can. And uh, let me know how many you sell at the end of the day when you get done, you know, it, it's just, it can't be done that way. And we need to invest in into the sales reps, into their systems, into their processes to really help them have a solid flow and experience so that they can in return, create that for customers. Love that. Such good advice. Well, Sean, thank, dude, everybody that is listening to this, hopefully got some extreme value. We try to get pretty technical on like best practices and things like that in this space. And uh, go check them out at Door to Door Con, January 14th and 15th. Make sure you guys are there. Um, and, you know, tickets, I think we got like 300, 400 tickets left. So go get tickets sooner than later. Those will sell out quick. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Sean. And continue to, to yeah, look forward to to continue this relationship, my man. Yeah, good to be with you, Sam. Okay, we'll see you guys. Much love. All right, we'll see you.